From the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Sunday afternoon session of the 194th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. Elder Quinton L. Cook of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Sunday afternoon session of the 109th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson has asked me to conduct this session. We extend our greetings to members of the Church and friends everywhere who are participating in these proceedings by radio, television, the Internet, or satellite transmission. The music for this session will be provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square under the direction of Mac Wilberg and Ryan Murphy, with Andrew Unsworth and Richard Elliott at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing, Come Rejoice. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Carlos G. Revillo of the Seventy. Dear Heavenly Father, 
we come before thee to begin this uh, concluding session of this marvelous conference with uh, gratitude in our hearts and thank thee for thy beloved son, Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent and his atoning sacrifice that allows us to be able to return to thy presence. We thank thee for the restoration of the gospel in these latter days. And we thank thee for the missionaries who preach the gospel throughout the world. May thou bless them. We're so grateful, Father, for prophets and apostles, and most especially to have our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, in our midst today. May thou bless him with strength as well as the First Presidency and all the Apostles. We pray at this time, Father, that Thou will send Thy Spirit to be with us that will help us understand and open our hearts. We pray also, Father, that Thou will increase our faith in Thee, that we may find more joy in our lives as we come unto Thee and follow thee. This is our humble prayer in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We will now be pleased to hear from Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Elder Taylor G. Godoy of the Seventy. After his remarks, the choir will sing, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling. We will then hear from Elder Gary E. Stevenson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and Elder Matthias Held of the Seventy. In 1832, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon received a remarkable vision concerning the destiny of God's children. This revelation spoke of three heavenly kingdoms. President Dallin H. Oaks spoke about these kingdoms of glory last October, noting that through the triumph and the glory of the Lamb, all but a relatively few individuals are eventually redeemed into one of these kingdoms according to the desires manifested through their choices. God's plan of redemption constitutes a universal opportunity for all His children, whenever and wherever they may have lived on the earth. While the glory of even the least of the three kingdoms, the telestial, surpasses all understanding, our Father's hope is that we will choose, and through the grace of His Son qualify for, the highest and most glorious of these kingdoms, the celestial, where we may enjoy eternal life as joint heirs with Christ. President Russell M. Nelson has urged us to think celestial, making the celestial kingdom our eternal goal, then carefully considering where each of our decisions while here on Earth will place us in the next world. Those in the celestial kingdom are they who received the testimony of Jesus, who are just men made perfect through Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. The inhabitants of the second or terrestrial kingdom are described as essentially good, including the honorable men of the earth who were blinded by the craftiness of men. Their principal limiting trait is that they are not valiant in the testimony of Jesus. By contrast, those in the lower celestial kingdom are those who received not the gospel, neither the testimony of Jesus. Note that the distinguishing characteristic for the inhabitants of each kingdom is how they relate to the testimony of Jesus, ranging from wholehearted devotion to not being valiant to outright rejection. On each person's reaction, hangs his or her eternal future. What is the testimony of Jesus? It is the witness of the Holy Spirit that He is the divine Son of God, the Messiah, 
and Redeemer. It is John's testimony that Jesus was in the beginning with God, the creator of heaven and earth, and in him was the gospel, and the gospel was the life, and the life was the light of men. It is the testimony of the apostles and prophets that he died, was buried, and rose again the third day and ascended into heaven. It is the knowledge that there is no other name given whereby salvation cometh. It is the testimony, last of all, given by the prophet Joseph Smith that he lives, that he is the only begotten of the Father, that by him and through him and of him the worlds are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God. Beyond this testimony is the question, what do we do about it? The inheritors of the celestial kingdom received the testimony of Jesus in the fullest sense by being baptized, receiving the Holy Ghost, and overcoming by faith. The principles and truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ govern their priorities and choices. The testimony of Jesus is manifest in what they are and what they are becoming. Their focus is on pursuing the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. At least some of those who will be found in the terrestrial kingdom also accept the testimony of Jesus, but they're distinguished by what they don't do about it. Not being valiant in the witness of the Savior suggests a degree of apathy or casualness, being lukewarm, as opposed to the people of Ammon in the Book of Mormon, for example, who were distinguished for their zeal towards God. The inhabitants of the celestial kingdom are those who reject the testimony of Jesus, along with his gospel, his covenants, and his prophets. They're described by Abinadi as having gone according to their own carnal wills and desires, having never called upon the Lord while the arms of mercy were extended towards them, for the arms of mercy were extended towards them, and they would not. What does it mean to be valiant in the testimony of Jesus? There are several possibilities that could be considered in answering this question. I'll mention a few. Being valiant in the testimony of Jesus surely includes nurturing and strengthening that testimony. True disciples do not ignore the seemingly small things that sustain and strengthen their testimony of Jesus, such as prayer, study of the scriptures, Sabbath observance, partaking of the sacrament, repentance, ministering, and worship in the house of the Lord. President Nelson reminds us that, quote, with frightening speed, a testimony that is not nourished daily by the good word of God can crumble. Thus, we need daily experiences worshiping the Lord and studying his gospel. Then he added, I plead with you to let God prevail in your life. Give him a fair share of your time. As you do, notice what happens to your positive spiritual momentum. Being valiant also suggests being open and public about one's witness. In baptism, we confirm our willingness to stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things and in all places that we may be in even until death. In this Easter season especially, we joyfully, publicly, and unreservedly proclaim our witness of the resurrected living Christ. One aspect of being valiant in the testimony of Jesus is to heed his messengers. God does not force us into the better path, the covenant path, but he instructs his prophets to make us fully aware of the consequences of our choices. And it's not just the members of his church. Through his prophets and apostles, he lovingly pleads with all the world to heed the truth that will make them free spare them needless suffering, and bring them enduring joy. Being valiant in the testimony of Jesus means encouraging others by word and example to likewise be valiant, especially those of our own families. Elder Neal A. Maxwell once addressed, quote, the essentially honorable members of the Church who are skimming over the surface instead of deepening their discipleship, who are casually engaged rather than anxiously engaged. Noting that all are free to choose, Elder Maxwell lamented, 
Unfortunately, however, when some choose slackness, they're choosing not only for themselves, but for the next generation and the next. Small equivo equivocations in parents can produce large deviations in their children. Each generation in a family or earlier generations in a family may have reflected dedication, while some in the current generation evidence equivocation. Sadly, in the next, some may choose dissension as erosion takes its toll. Years ago, Elder John H. Groberg related the story of a young family living in a small branch in Hawaii in the early 1900s. They had been members of the Church for about two years when one of their daughters fell ill with an undiagnosed disease and was hospitalized. At church the next Sunday, the father and his son prepared the sacrament, as they did most weeks. But as the young father knelt to bless the bread, the branch president, suddenly realizing who was at the sacrament table, jumped up and cried, Stop! You can't touch the sacrament. Your daughter has an unknown disease. Leave immediately while someone else fixes new sacrament bread. We can't have you here. Go! The stunned father searchingly looked at the branch president and then the congregation, and sensing the depth of anxiety and embarrassment from all, motioned to his family, and they quietly filed out of the chapel. Not a word was said as, dejectedly, the family walked along the trail to their small home. There they sat in a circle, and the father said, Please be silent until I am ready to speak. The young son wondered what they would do to get revenge for the shame they had suffered. Would they kill the branch president's pigs, <laughs> or burn his house, <laughs> or join another church? Five, ten, fifteen, twenty-five minutes passed in silence. The father's clenched fists began to relax, and tears formed in his eyes. The mother began to cry, and soon each of the children was quietly weeping. The father turned to his wife and said, I love you, and then repeated those words to each of their children. I love all of you, and I want us to be together forever as a family. And the only way that can be is for all of us to be good members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and be sealed by the holy priesthood in the temple. This is not the branch president's church. It's the Church of Jesus Christ. We will not allow any man or any hurt or embarrassment or pride to keep us from being together forever. Next Sunday, we'll go back to church. We'll stay by ourselves until our daughter's sickness is known, but we will go back. They did go back. Their daughter recovered, and the family was sealed in the Laie Hawaii Temple when it was completed. Today, well over 100 souls call their father, grandfather, and great-grandfather blessed because he kept his eyes on eternity. One last aspect of being valiant in the testimony of Jesus that I will mention is our individual pursuit of personal holiness. Jesus is our essential Redeemer, and He pleads, Repent, all ye ends of the earth, and come unto me and be baptized in my name, that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost, that ye may stand spotless before me at the last day. The prophet Mormon describes one group of saints who persevered in this manner despite having to wade through much affliction. Nevertheless, they did pray and did fast and pray oft, and did wax stronger and stronger in their humility and firmer and firmer in the faith of Christ, unto the filling their souls with joy and consolation, yea, even to the purifying and the sanctification of their hearts, which sanctification cometh because of their yielding their hearts unto God. It is this mighty change of heart, yielding our hearts of God and being spiritually reborn through the grace of the Savior that we seek. 
My invitation is to act now to secure your place as one who is valiant in the testimony of Jesus. As repentance may be needed, do not procrastinate the day of your repentance. Lest in an hour when you think not, the summer shall be past and the harvest ended and your souls not saved. Be zealous in keeping your covenants with God. Do not be offended by the strictness of the word. Remember to retain the name of Christ written always in your hearts, that ye may hear and know the voice by which ye shall be called and also the name by which he shall call you. And finally, settle this in your hearts, <clears throat> that ye will do the things which Jesus shall teach and command you. Our Father wants all His children who will to enjoy eternal life with Him in His celestial kingdom. Jesus suffered, died, and was resurrected to make that possible. He hath ascended into heaven and hath sat down on the right hand of God to claim of the Father His rights of mercy, which He hath upon all the children of men. I pray that we may all be blessed with a burning testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rejoice and be valiant in that testimony and enjoy the fruits of His grace in our lives continually. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Today I would like to begin by testifying of the complete certainty within my heart that God hears our prayers and answers them in a personalized way. In a world going through times of uncertainty, pain, disappointment, and heartbreak, we might feel inclined to rely more on personal abilities and preferences, as well as the knowledge and security that comes from the world. This could cause us to put in the background the real source of succor and support that can counter the challenges of this mortal life. I remember an occasion when I was hospitalized for an illness and it was difficult for me to sleep. When I turned off the lights and the room became dark, I saw a reflective sign on the ceiling in front of me that said, call, don't fall. To my surprise, the next day I observed the same message repeated in several parts of the room. Why was that message so important? When I asked the nurse about it, she said, it is to prevent a blow that might increase the pain you already have. This life, by its nature, brings painful experiences, some inherent to our physical bodies, some due to our weaknesses or afflictions, some due to the way others use their agency, and some due to our use of agency. Is there a promise more powerful than the one the Savior himself made when he declared, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock or call and it shall be open unto you. Prayer is the means of communication with our Heavenly Father that allows us to call and don't fall. However, there are circumstances in which we might think that the call has not been heard because we do not receive an immediate response or one according to our expectations. This sometimes leads to anxiety, sadness, or disappointment. I remember Nephi's expression of the faith in the Lord when he said, How is that he cannot instruct me that I should build a ship? Now I ask you, how is that the Lord cannot instruct you that you do not fall? Confidence in God's answers implies accepting that his ways are not our ways and that all things must come to pass in their time. The certainty of knowing that we are children of a loving and merciful Heavenly Father should be the motivation to call in devout prayer with an attitude of praying always and not fainting, as our performance may be for the welfare of our souls. Imagine the feelings of Heavenly Father when in each prayer we make a supplication in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. What power and tenderness, I believe, are displayed when we do so. The scriptures are full of examples of those who called out to God so they would not fall. Helaman and his army, while facing their afflictions, called upon God, 
pouring out their souls in prayer. They received assurance, peace, faith, and hope, gaining courage and determination until they achieved their goal. Imagine how Moses would have called and cried out to God when finding himself between the Red Sea and the Egyptians approached to attack, or Abraham when obeying the mandate to sacrifice his son Isaac. I'm certain that each of you have had and will have experiences where calling will be the answer to not fall. Three years ago, while my wife and I were preparing for our civil marriage and our temple marriage, we received a call informing us that civil marriages were canceled due to a strike. We received the call three days before the scheduled ceremony. After several attempts at other offices and not finding available appointments, we began to feel distress and doubtful that we really could get married as planned. My fiancé and I called, putting our souls to God in prayer. Finally, someone told us about an office in a small town on the, on the outskirts of the city where an acquaintance was the mayor. Without hesitation, we went to visit him and asked him if it would be possible to marry us. To our joy, he agreed. His secretary emphasized to us that we had to obtain a certificate in that city and deliver all the documents before noon the next day. The next day, we moved to the small town and went to the police station to request the required document. To our surprise, the officer said that he would not give it to us because many young couples had been running away from their families to get married secretly in that town, which of course was not our case. Again, fear and sadness overtook us. I remember how I silently called out to my Heavenly Father so as not to fall. I received a clear impression in my mind, repeatedly saying, temper recommend, temper recommend. I immediately took out my temper recommend and handed it to the officer to my fiance's bewilderment. What a surprise we had when we heard the officer say, why didn't you tell me that you are from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? I know your church well. So he immediately began to prepare the document. We were even more surprised when the officer left the station without saying anything. Fifty minutes passed, and, did, and he did not return. It was already 11.55 in the morning, and we only had until noon to deliver the papers. Suddenly, he appeared with a beautiful puppy and told us it was a wedding gift and gave it to us <laughs> along with the document. We ran toward the mayor's office with our document and our new dog. <laughs> then we saw an official vehicle coming toward us. I stopped in front of it. The vehicle stopped and we saw the secretary inside. Seeing us, she said, I'm sorry, I told you noon. I must go on another errand. I humbled myself in silence, calling with all my heart to my Heavenly Father, asking for help once again to not fall. Suddenly, the miracle happened. The secretary said to us, what a beautiful dog you have. Where could I find one like that for my son? It's for you, we immediately replied. <laughs> the secretary looked at us with surprise and said, OK, let's go to the office and make the arrangement. <laughs> Two days later, Carol and I were married civilly as planned, and then we were sealed in the Lima Peru Temple. Of course, we need to remember that calling is a matter of faith and action. Faith to recognize that we have a Heavenly Father who answers our prayers according to His infinite wisdom. And then, action consistent with what we ask for. Praying, calling, can be a sign of our hope. But taking action after praying is a sign that our faith is real. Faith that is tested in moments of pain, fear, or disappointment. I suggest you consider the following. First, always think of the Lord as your first option for help. Then, second, call, don't fall, turn to God in sincere prayer. Third, after praying, do all you can to obtain the blessings you pray for. 
Fourth, humble yourselves to accept the answer in his time and his way. And fifth, don't stop. Keep moving forward on the covenant path while you wait for an answer. Perhaps there is someone right now who, due to circumstances, feels like they are about to fall and would like to call like Joseph Smith did when he cried out, Oh God, what art thou? How long shall thy hand be stayed? Even in circumstances such as these, pray with a spiritual momentum, as President Nelson taught, because your prayers are always heard. Remember this hymn. Are you left your room this morning? Did you think to pray? In the name of Christ, our Savior, did you suffer love in favor as a, as a shield today? Oh, how pray and rest the weary. Prayer will change the night today. So when life gets dark and dreary, don't forget to pray. As we pray, we can feel the embrace of our Heavenly Father, who sent His only begotten Son to relieve our burdens. Because if we call out to God, I testify, we will not fall. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
As Lisa and I travel on assignment throughout the world, we relish the privilege of meeting you in congregations large and small. Your devotion to the work of the Lord buoys us up and stands as a testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We return home from each trip wondering if we possibly gave as much as we received. When traveling, there is little time for sightseeing. However, when possible, I spend a few moments in a particular passion. I have an interest in architecture and design with a special fascination with bridges. Suspension bridges amaze me. Whether it's the Rainbow Bridge in Tokyo, the Tsing Ma Bridge in Hong Kong, the Tower Bridge in London, or others I have seen, I marvel at the engineering genius behind these complicated structures. Bridges take us places otherwise we would not be able to go. Now, before I continue, I note that this, since this message was prepared, a tragic bridge accident occurred in Baltimore, and we mourn the loss of life and offer condolences to those affected families. Recently, a conference assignment took me to California, where I once again crossed the iconic Golden Gate Bridge, regarded as an engineering wonder of the world. This monumental structure intertwines beautiful form, functional purpose, and masterful engineering. It is a classical suspension bridge with bookend towers supported by massive piers. The colossal, majestic, weight-bearing twin towers soaring above the ocean were the first elements to be constructed. Together, they shoulder the load of the sweeping main suspension cables, the vertical suspender cables, which cradle the roadway below. The extraordinary stabilizing capacity, the power of the tower is the magic behind the engineering of the bridge. Early construction images of the bridge bear testimony of this engineering principle. Each bridge element finds weight-bearing support from the symmetrical towers, both interde interdependently connected one to another. When the bridge is complete with its two powerful towers firmly in place and piers anchored in the foundation of bedrock, it is an image of strength and beauty. Today, I invite you to look at the stately bridge with its ascending twin towers built on a strong foundation through a gospel lens. In the twilight of Jesus Christ's ministry during what we now call Holy Week, a Pharisee who was a lawyer asked the Savior a question he knew was nearly impossible to answer. Master, what is the great commandment in the law? The lawyer tempting him and seeking a legalistic answer with seemingly deceitful intent received a genuine, sacred, divine response. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Hearkening to our bridge analogy, the first tower. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is the second tower. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, the remaining elements of the bridge. Let's examine each of the two great commandments re revealed and recited in Jesus Christ's response. As we do so, let the image of the majestic suspension bridge resonate in your mind's eye. The first, to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. In this answer, Jesus Christ condenses the essence of the law embodied in the sacred teachings of the Old Testament. To love the Lord centers first on your heart, your very nature. The Lord asks you to love with all your soul, your entire consecrated being, and to love with all your mind, your intelligence and intellect. Love for God is not limited or finite. It is infinite and eternal. For me, the application of the first great commandment can sometimes feel abstract or even daunting. Gratefully, as I consider further words of Jesus, this commandment becomes more graspable. If ye love me, keep my commandments. This I can do. I can love Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, which leads to prayer, scripture study, and temple worship. We love the Father and the Son through the payment of tithes, keeping the Sabbath day holy, living a virtuous and chaste life, and 
being obedient. Love is often measured in small daily deeds, footsteps on the covenant path for young people, using social media to build up rather than tear down, leaving the party, movie, or activity where standards might be challenged, showing reverence for things sacred. Consider this tender example. It was Fast Sunday as Vance and I knocked on the door of a small, humble home. We and other deacons in the quorum had come to expect the words, please come in, yelled warmly in a thick German accent, loud enough to hear through the door. Sister Mueller was one of several immigrant widows in the ward. She couldn't answer the door very easily as she was legally blind. Stepping inside the dimly lit home, she greeted us with kind questions. What are your names? How are you doing? Do you love the Lord? We answered and shared that we had come to receive her fast offering. Even our, at our young age, her meager circumstances were readily apparent, and her faith-filled response was profoundly touching. I placed a dime on the counter earlier this morning. I am so grateful to offer my fast offering. Would you be kind enough to place it in the envelope and fill out my fast offering receipt? Her love of the Lord lifted our faith each time we left her home. King Benjamin promised remarkable power for those who follow the first great commandment. I would desire that you should consider on the blessed and happy state of those that keep the commandments. They are blessed in all things, and if they hold out to the end, they are received into heaven in a state of never-ending happiness. Loving the Lord leads to eternal happiness. Jesus then said, And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is the second tower of the bridge. Here Jesus bridges our heavenly upward gaze to love the Lord with our earthly outward gaze to love our fellow men. One is interdependent on the other. Love of the Lord is not complete if we, look, if we neglect our neighbors. This outward love includes all of God's children without regard to gender, social class, race, sexuality, income, age, or ethnicity. We seek out those who are hurt and broken, the marginalized, for all are like unto God. We succor the weak, lift up the hands which hang down, and strengthen the feeble knees. Consider this example. Brother Evans was surprised when he was prompted to stop his car and knock on an unknown door of an unknown family. When a widowed mother of over 10 answered the door, their difficult circumstances and great needs became readily apparent to him. The first was simple, paint for their home which was followed by many years of temporal and spiritual ministering to this family. This thankful mother later wrote of her heaven-sent friend, You have spent your life reaching out to the least of us. How I would love to hear the things the Lord has to say to you as He expresses His appreciation for the good you have done financially and spiritually, for the people that only you and He will ever know about. Thank you for, the, for blessing us in so many ways, for the missionaries you provided for. I often wonder if the Lord picked on you exclusively or if you were just the one who listened. To love your neighbor includes Christ-like deeds of kindness and service. Can you let go of grudges, forgive enemies, welcome and minister to your neighbors and assist the elderly? You'll each be inspired as you build your tower of love for neighbor. President Russell M. Nelson taught, giving help to others, making a conscientious effort to care about others as much as or more than we care about ourselves is our joy, especially when it is not convenient and when it takes us out of our comfort zone. Living that great second commandment is the key to becoming a true disciple of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you, 
Jesus further taught, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is very instructive. There is an important interdependency between loving the Lord and loving one another. For the Golden Gate Bridge to perform its design function, both towers are equally strong and with equal power bear the weight of the suspension cables, the roadway, and the traffic crossing the bridge. Without this engineering symmetry, the bridge could be compromised, even leading to collapse. For any suspension bridge to do what it was built to do, its towers must function together in complete harmony. Likewise, our ability to follow Jesus Christ depends upon our strength and power to live the first and second commandments with balance and equal devotion to both. The increasing contention in the world suggests, however, that we at times fail to see or remember this. Some are so focused on keeping the commandments that they show little tolerance of those they see as less righteous. Some find it difficult to love those who are choosing their lives outside of the covenant or even away from any religious participation. Alternatively, there are those who emphasize the importance of loving others without acknowledgement that we're all accountable to God. Some refuse entirely the notion that there is such a thing as absolute truth or right and wrong, and that the only thing required of us is complete tolerance and acceptance of the choices of others. Either of these imbalances could cause your spiritual bridge to tip or even fall. President Dallin H. Oaks described this when he said, we are commanded to love everyone, since Jesus' peril of the Good Samaritan teaches that everyone is our neighbor. But our zeal to keep the second commandment much, must not cause us to forget the first, to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. So the question for each of us is this, how do we build our own bridge of faith and devotion? erecting tall bridge towers of both loving God and loving our neighbors. Well, we just start. Our initial efforts might look like the plan on the back of a napkin or an early stage blueprint of the bridge we hope to construct. It might consist of a few realistic goals to understand the Lord's gospel, the Lord's gospel more or to vow to judge others less. No one is too young or too old to begin. Over time, with prayerful and thoughtful planning, rough ideas are refined. New actions become habits. Early drafts become polished blueprints. We build our personal spiritual bridge with hearts and minds devoted to Heavenly Father and His only begotten Son, as well as to our brothers and sisters with whom we work, play, and live. So in the, days of, in the days of head when you pass over a majestic suspension bridge, or even when you see a picture with its soaring towers, I invite you to remember the two great commandments described by Jesus Christ in the New Testament. May the Lord's instructions inspire us. May our hearts and minds be lifted upward to love the Lord and turned outward to love our neighbor. May this strengthen our faith in Jesus Christ and His Atonement, of which I testify. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Recently, while driving in a city unknown to us, I inadvertently took a wrong turn which led my wife and me onto an express highway for endless miles without being able to turn around again. We had received a kind invitation uh, to a friend's home and worried that we would now arrive much later than we were expected to. While on this highway and desperately looking for a way out again, I blamed myself for not paying better attention to the navigation system. This experience caused me to think about how in our lives we sometimes make wrong decisions and how we must live with the consequences 
humbly and patiently until we are able to change our course again. Life is all about making choices. Our Father in Heaven gave us the divine gift of agency precisely so that we could learn from our choices, from the right ones and also from the wrong ones. We correct our wrong choices when we repent. This is where growth happens. Heavenly Father's plan for all of us is about learning, developing, and progressing towards eternal life. Ever since my wife and I were taught by the missionaries and joined the Church many years ago, I have always been impressed by the profound teachings that Lehi gave, gave to his son Jacob in the Book of Mormon. He taught him that the Lord gave unto man that he should act for himself, and that it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. To be able to exercise our agency, we need to have opposing options to consider. And in doing so, the Book of Mormon also reminds us that we have been instructed sufficiently and that the Spirit of Christ has been given to every one of us to know good from evil. In life, we constantly confront many important choices. For example, choosing whether or not we will follow God's commandments, choosing to have faith and recognize when miracles happen, or skeptically wait for something to happen before cho choosing to believe only then choosing to develop trust in God or fearfully anticipate another challenge the next day. As when I took the uh, wrong turn on that highway, suffering from the consequences of our own poor decisions can often be especially painful because we only have ourselves to blame. Nevertheless, we can always choose to receive comfort through the divine process of repentance, make wrong things right again, and in doing so, learn some life-changing lessons. Sometimes we can also experience opposition and trials from things outside of our control, such as, for example, moments of health and periods of sickness, times of peace and times of war hours of day and of night, and seasons of summer and of winter, times of labor followed by times of rest. Even though we usually cannot choose between these kinds of situations because they just happen, we are still free to choose how to react to them. We can do so with a positive or with a pessimistic attitude. We can seek to learn from the experience and ask for our Lord's help and support, or we can think that we are on our own in this trial and that we must suffer it alone. We can adjust our sails to the new reality, or we can decide not to change anything. In the darkness of night, we can turn on our lights. In the cold of winter, we should choose to wear warm clothes, in seasons of sickness, we can seek medical and spiritual help. We choose how to react to these circumstances. Adjust, learn, seek, choose are all action verbs. Remember that we are agents and not objects. Let us never forget that Jesus promised to take upon him the pains and sicknesses of his people that he may succor or help us as we turn to Him. We can choose to build our foundation on the rock that is Jesus Christ so that when the world when comes, it shall have no power over us. He has promised that whosoever will come to Him, Him will He receive, and blessed are those who come unto Him. Now, there is one additional principle that is especially important. Lehi said that there must, be, must needs be an opposition in all things. This means that opposites don't exist apart from each other. 
they can even complement each other. We would not be able to identify joy unless we had also experienced sorrow at some point. Feeling hungry at times helps us to be especially grateful when we do have enough to eat again. We would not be able to identify truth unless we had also seen lies here and there. These opposites are all like the two sides of one same coin. Both sides are always present. Charles Dickens provided an example of this idea when he wrote that it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Let me give an example from our own life. Getting married, forming a family, and having children brought to us the greatest moments of joy we have ever experienced in our lives but also the most profound moments of pain, anguish, and grief when something happened to any one of us. Infinite joy and bliss with our children were sometimes also followed by recurring periods of sicknesses, hospitalizations, and sleepless nights filled with distress, as well as finding relief in prayers and priesthood blessings. These contrasting experiences taught us that we are never alone in moments of suffering and that they, they also showed us how much we can carry with the Lord's succor and help. These experiences helped to shape us in wonderful ways and it has all been totally worthwhile. Is this not what we came here for? In the scriptures we also find some interesting examples. Lehi taught his son Jacob that the afflictions he suffered in the wilderness helped him know, know the greatness of God and that God shall consecrate his afflictions to his gain. During Joseph Smith's cruel incarceration in Liberty Jail, the Lord told him that all these things shall give him experience and shall be for his good. Finally, Jesus Christ's infinite sacrifice was certainly the greatest example of pain and suffering ever seen, but it also brought about the wonderful blessings of his atonement to all of God's children. Where there is sunshine, shadows must be there too. Floods can bring destruction, but they usually bring life as well. Tears of grief often turn into tears of relief and happiness. Feelings of sadness when loved ones depart are later compensated with the joy of meeting again. In periods of war and destruction, many little acts of kindness and love are also happening for those with eyes to see and ears to hear. Our, wor our world today is often characterized by fear and anxiety, fear of what the future might bring for us. But Jesus has taught us to trust and to look unto him in every thought, doubt not, fear not. Let us constantly make a very conscious effort to see both sides of every coin allotted to us in our lives. Even though both sides might sometimes not be immediately visible to us, we can know and trust that they are always there we can rest assured that our difficulties, sorrows, afflictions, and pains do not define us. Rather, it is how we go about them that will help us grow, grow and draw closer to God. It is our attitudes and choices that define us much better than our challenges. When in health, cherish and be grateful for it every moment. When in sickness, seek to patiently learn from it and know that this can change again according to God's will. When in sorrow, trust that happiness is around the corner. We often just cannot see it yet. Consciously shift your focus and elevate your thoughts to the positive aspects of challenges because they are always undoubtedly there too. Never forget to be grateful. Choose to believe. Choose to have faith in Jesus Christ. Choose to always trust God. Choose to think celestial, as President Nelson recently taught us. Let us always be mindful of our Heavenly Father's wonderful plan for us. He loves us and sent his beloved Son to help in our trials and to open for us the door to return to him. Jesus Christ lives and stands there at every moment 
waiting for us to choose to call upon him to provide succor, strength, and salvation. Of these things I testify in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. As directed, the congregation will join the choir <clears throat> in singing How Firm a Foundation. <clears throat> After the singing, we will hear from Elder Neil L. Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by President Mark L. Pace, who serves as Sunday School General President. This is the Sunday afternoon session of the 194th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Don't you love those beautiful words we just sang? I'll strengthen thee, I'll help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. The Lord is strengthening his saints of all ages as they come to his holy house. From Kinshasa to Zolikofen to Fukuoka to Oakland, the youth of their own initiative our overflowing temple baptistries. In the past, most beloved ordinance workers had graying hair, but not anymore. Called missionaries, service missionaries, and return missionaries are around every corner. Across the world, there's a growing feeling drawing us to the house of the Lord. Just over a year ago, a dear family friend, aged 95, living on the east coast of the United States, 
who had been taught by missionaries for 70 years, said to her daughter, I want to go to the temple with you. Her daughter replied, Well, mother, you first need to be baptized. Okay, she replied, then I want to be baptized. She was baptized. A few days later, she reverently entered the temple baptistry. And just over a month ago, she received her own endowment and sealing. The knowledge and power of God are expanding. The veil or the earth is beginning to burst. Have you wondered why the Lord would direct his prophet to now dot the earth with his holy temples? Why would he at this specific time give the needed prosperity to his covenant people that through their sacred tithes, hundreds of houses of the Lord could be built? This morning, President Oaks showed a beautiful visual of the temples being constructed across the world. Kathy and I were recently in the Philippines. Think of this miracle. The Manila Temple was dedicated in 1984. It would be 26 years before the second temple in Cebu City was completed in 2010. Now, 14 years later, 11 temples are being constructed, designed, or prepared for dedication. From the north to the south, Loag, Tugegaran, Santiago, Urdaneta, Alavon, Naga, Tacloban City, Ilo Ilo, Bacolod, Cagayan de Oro, and Devon. It is breathtaking to see the wondrous works of God. Across the globe, houses of the Lord are coming closer to us. Why in our day? The Lord told us that in the last days, there would be distress among nations. People would be lovers of their own selves. All things would be in commotion. Confusion would abound, and men's hearts would fail them. We have certainly seen men's and women's hearts fail them. The enticements of the world, the distraction of alluring voices, the neglect of spiritual nourishment, the fatigue from the demands of discipleship. Perhaps you have been saddened as you have seen someone you love who at one time spoke sincerely of his and her faith in Jesus Christ, or witness of the Book of Mormon and eagerly helped build the kingdom of God, suddenly move away, at least for now, from his or her beliefs toward the sidelines of the church. My counsel to you is don't despair. All is well, for with God, nothing is impossible. With this prophesied commotion and disbelief in the world, the Lord promised that there would be a covenant people, a people eagerly awaiting his return, a people who stand in holy settings and are not moved out of their place. He spoke of a righteous people, resisting the deceptions of the adversary, disciplining their faith, thinking celestial, and trusting completely in the Savior, Jesus Christ. Why is the Lord now bringing hundreds of his temples closer to us? One reason is that amid the turmoil and temptations of the world, he has promised to strengthen and bless his covenant saints, and his promises are being fulfilled. How do these holy houses strengthen, comfort, and protect us? We find an answer in the pleadings of the Prophet Joseph Smith in the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. It was in this temple where the saints sang, will sing, and will shout with the armies of heaven. The Savior himself appeared, and prophets of old returned, bestowing additional priesthood keys to the restored gospel. On that sacred occasion in the Kirtland Temple, the prophet prayed that in the Lord's holy house, the saints would be armed with the power of God, that the name of Jesus Christ would be upon them, that his angels would have charge over them, and that they would grow up in the Lord and receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost. 
These powerful supplications are fulfilled in our lives as we faithfully worship in the house of the Lord. In His house, we are literally endowed with heavenly power. Our faith in Jesus Christ and our love for Him is confirmed and fortified. We are spiritually assured of our true identity and the purposes of life. As we are faithful, we are blessed with protection from temptations and distractions. We feel our Savior's love as He lifts us from our difficulties and sorrows. We are armed with the power of God. In His holy house, we take His name more completely upon us. When we are baptized, we profess our belief in Him and our willingness to keep His commandments. In the temple, we sacredly promise through our covenants to follow Him forever. The youth of this church are incredible. In a difficult world, they take upon themselves the name of Christ. In Heber City, Utah, a public meeting was held to discuss the details of a temple planned for construction. 300 youth filled the adjoining park to show their support for the proposed temple. One young man, speaking to government leaders in an open forum, courageously explained, I am hoping to be married in this temple. The temple will help me to keep myself clean and pure. Another described the temple as a symbol of light and hope. Young men and women of the church throughout the world are embracing the name of Jesus Christ. In the Kirtland Temple, the prophet Joseph prayed that angels would have charge over his saints. Regularly performing ordinances for our ancestors in the temple brings a sweet and sure confirmation that life continues beyond the veil. Although many of our experiences in the house of the Lord are too sacred to share publicly, some we can share. Forty years ago, while living in Florida, Kathy and I traveled to the temple in Atlanta, Georgia. On Wednesday night, May 9, 1984, as we completed a session in the temple, an ordinance worker approached me and asked if I had time to do just one preparatory initiatory ordinance. The name of the person I represented was unusual. His name was Eliezer Cerci. The next day, the temple was full of saints. As I prepared to perform my second endowment of the day, I was given the name of the person I would represent. Surprisingly, the name was the same individual from the night before, Eliezer Cerci. I felt the Spirit of the Lord as the endowment was completed. Later in the afternoon, still in the temple, Kathy saw an elderly family friend, Sister Dolly Fernandez, who now lived in Atlanta. With no male members of her family with her, she asked if I could possibly assist in the sealing of her father to her father's parents. I, of course, was very honored. As I knelt at the end of the altar for this sacred ordinance, I heard once again the name that was now inscribed in my mind, her father, Eliezer Cerci. I fully believe that following this life, I will meet and embrace a man known in his mortal life as Eliezer Cerci. Most of our experiences in the house of the Lord bring joyful peace and quiet revelation, more than dramatic intervention. But be assured, angels do have charge over us. The gift of the Holy Ghost is given to us as we are confirmed a member of the Church. Each week, as we worthily partake of the bread and water in remembrance of our Savior, we are promised His Spirit will always be with us. As we come with willing hearts to the house of the Lord, the most holy place on earth, we grow up in the Lord and can receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost. Through the power of the Holy Ghost, 
we are filled with peace and joy and unspeakable hope. We receive the strength to remain his disciples even when we find ourselves outside of holy places. President Russell M. Nelson has declared, our Savior and Redeemer Jesus Christ will perform some of his mightiest works between now and when he comes again. We will see miraculous indications that God the Father and Jesus Christ preside over this church in majesty and glory. Dotting the earth with houses of the Lord is a mighty work and miraculous indication. My beloved friends, if we are able and have not already increased our attendance at the temple, let us regularly find more time to worship in the house of the Lord. Let us pray for the temples that have been announced, that properties can be purchased, that governments will approve plans, that talented workers will see their gifts magnified, and that the sacred dedications will bring the approval of heaven and the visit of angels. The temple is literally the house of the Lord. I promise you, as you come worthily and prayerfully to his holy house, you will be armed with his power, his name will be upon you, his angels will have charge over you, and you will grow up in the blessing of the Holy Ghost. The Lord promised, every soul who forsaketh his sins and cometh unto me and calleth on my name and obeyeth my voice and keepeth my commandments shall see my face and know that I am. There are many different ways to see the face of Christ, and there is no better place than in his holy house. In this day of confusion and commotion, I testify that the temple is his holy house and will help preserve us, protect us, and prepare us for the glorious day when with all his holy angels, our Savior returns in majesty, power, and great glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Dear brothers and sisters, we are so grateful for your efforts in reading the scriptures with Come, Follow Me. Thank you. Thank you for all that you are doing. Your daily connection with God and His Word has profound consequences. Ye are laying the foundation of a great work, and out of small things proceedeth that which is great. Reading the Savior's teachings in the scriptures helps us transform our homes into sanctuaries of faith and centers of gospel learning. It invites the Spirit into our homes. The Holy Ghost fills our souls with joy and converts us into lifelong disciples of Jesus Christ. Over these last several years, while reading the books of Holy Scripture, we have observed the panorama of God's teachings to His children in all the major gospel dispensations. In every dispensation, we have seen a familiar pattern. God restores or reveals the gospel of Jesus Christ through His prophets. The people follow the prophets and are greatly blessed. However, over time, some people stop heeding the words of the prophets and distance themselves from the Lord and His gospel. This is what we call apostasy. The gospel was first revealed to Adam, but some of the children of Adam and Eve turned away from the Lord in apostasy. We see a pattern of restoration and apostasy repeated in the dispensations of Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and others. Now, today we live in the dispensation of the fullness of times. This is the only dispensation that will not end in an apostasy. It is this dispensation that will usher in the second coming of the Savior Jesus Christ and His millennial reign. So what's different about this dispensation? What has the Lord provided us today, especially for our time, that will help us draw near to the Savior and never leave Him. 
One answer that comes to my mind is the scriptures, and particularly the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. While God has promised there will never be another general apostasy, we need to be mindful and careful to avoid a personal apostasy, remembering, as President Russell M. Nelson has taught, we are each responsible for our individual spiritual growth. Studying the Book of Mormon as we are doing this year always brings us closer to the Savior and helps us stay close to Him. We call it study, and that's good because it implies effort, but we don't always need to learn some new fact. Sometimes reading the Book of Mormon is just about feeling connected to God today, nourishing the soul, being strengthened spiritually before heading out to face the world, or finding healing after a rough day out in the world. We study the scriptures so the Holy Ghost, the great teacher, can deepen our conversion to Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ and help us become more like them. With these thoughts in mind, we could consider what has the Holy Ghost taught us this week during our study of the Book of Mormon, and how does this bring us closer to the Savior? These are good questions for our scripture study at home. They are also excellent questions to start a Sunday class at church. We improve our teaching at church on Sunday by improving our learning at home during the week. Thus, in our Sunday classes, he that preacheth and he that receiveth understand one another, and both are edified and rejoice together. Here are a few verses the Spirit has impressed upon my mind from this week's Book of Mormon study. Nephi instructed Jacob to preserve these plates and hand them down from generation to generation, and if there were preaching which was sacred or revelation or prophesying, Jacob should engraven them upon these plates for the sake of their people. Jacob later testified, We searched the scriptures, and having all these witnesses, we obtain a hope, and our faith becometh unshaken. Now these verses caused me to remember what Nephi had said previously about the brass plates. We had obtained the records and searched them, and found that they were of great worth unto us, insomuch that we could preserve the commandments of the Lord unto our children. Wherefore, it was wisdom in the Lord that we should carry them with us as we journeyed in the wilderness towards the land of promise. Now, if it was wisdom for Lehi and his family to have the scriptures, it is just as wise for us today. The great worth and spiritual power of the scriptures continues undimmed in our lives today. There has never been a people in history with the access to the Book of Mormon and other scriptures that we enjoy today. Yes, Lehi and his family were blessed to carry the brass plates with them, but they didn't have a copy for every tent. The most important copy of the Book of Mormon is our personal copy. It's the copy that we read. In Lehi's vision of the Tree of Life, Lehi taught us the importance of personal experience with the love of God. After he partook of the fruit, Lehi saw his wife Sariah and his sons Nephi and Sam a little way off. They stood as if they knew not whither they should go. I beckoned unto them, Lehi said, and I also did say unto them with a loud voice that they should come unto me and partake of the fruit which was desirable above all other fruit. And they did come unto me and partake of the fruit. <clears throat> I love Lehi's example of intentional parenting. Sariah, Nephi, and Sam were good, righteous, living good, righteous lives, but the Lord had something better, something sweeter for them. They didn't know where to find it, but Lehi did, so he called to them with a loud voice to come to the tree of life and partake of the fruit for themselves. His direction was clear. There could be no misunderstanding. I am the product of a similar kind of intentional parenting. When I was a young boy, maybe 11 or 12 years old, my mother asked me, Mark, do you know for yourself by the Holy Ghost that the gospel is true? Her question surprised me. I had always tried to be a good boy, and, and I thought that was enough. 
But my mother, like Lehi, knew that something more was needed. I needed to act and know for myself. I replied that I had not yet had that experience, and she didn't seem surprised at all by my answer. She, said, she then said something I have never forgotten. I remember her words to this day. Heavenly Father wants you to know for yourself, but you must put in the effort. You need to read the Book of Mormon and pray to know by the Holy Ghost, Heavenly Father will answer your prayers. Well, I had never read the Book of Mormon before. I didn't think I was old enough to do that, but my mother knew better. Her question ignited in me a desire to know for myself. So each night in the bedroom I shared with two of my brothers, I turned on the light above my bed and read a chapter in the Book of Mormon. Then turning off the light, I slipped out of my bed onto my knees and prayed. I prayed more sincerely and with greater desire than I ever had before. I asked Heavenly Father to please let me know of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. From the time I started reading the Book of Mormon, I felt that Heavenly Father was aware of my efforts and felt that it mattered to Him. As I read and prayed, comfortable, peaceful feelings rested upon me. Chapter by chapter, the light of faith was growing brighter inside my soul. In time, I realized that these confirmations, these feelings, were confirmations of truth from the Holy Ghost. I came to know for myself that the Book of Mormon is true and that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. How grateful I am for my mother's inspired invitation. This experience reading the Book of Mormon as a boy started a pattern of scripture study that continues to bless me to this day. I still read the Book of Mormon and kneel in prayer, and the Holy Ghost confirms its truths over and over again. Nephi said it right, it was wisdom in the Lord that we should carry the scriptures with us throughout our lives. The Book of Mormon is the keystone that makes this dispensation different from all previous dispensations. As we study the Book of Mormon and follow the living prophet, there will be no personal apostasy in our lives. The invitation to come to the tree of life by holding fast to the Word of God is not just an invitation from Lehi to his family, and it is not just an invitation from my mother for me to read and pray about the Book of Mormon. It is also an invitation from our prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, to each one of us. I promise, he said, that as you prayerfully study the Book of Mormon every day, you will make better decisions every day. I promise that as you ponder what you study, the windows of heaven will open and you will receive answers to your own questions and direction for your own life. It is my prayer that reading the Book of Mormon this year will be a joy and a blessing for each of us and will draw us ever nearer to the Savior. Heavenly Father lives. Jesus Christ is our Savior and Redeemer. The Book of Mormon contains His words and conveys His love. President Russell M. Nelson is the Lord's living prophet on the earth today. I know these things to be true because of the confirming witness of the Holy Ghost, which witness I first received while reading the Book of Mormon as a boy. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. At the conclusion of the conference, we express sincere appreciation to all who have worked so diligently to prepare for these services. We thank those who have spoken and those who have provided the uplifting music. The concluding speaker for this session will be our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Following President Nelson's remarks, the choir will close this conference by singing, Now Let Us Rejoice. The benediction will then be offered by Sister Amy A. Wright, who serves as first counselor in the primary general presidency, and the conference will be adjourned. My dear brothers and sisters, 
Today is an historic day for President Dallin H. Oaks and me. It was 40 years ago, on April 7, 1984, when we were called to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. We have rejoiced in each and every general conference since then, including this one. We have once again been blessed with a sacred outpouring of the Spirit. I hope you will repeatedly study the messages of this conference throughout the coming months. When I was born, there were six functioning temples in the church, one each in St. George, Logan, Manti, and Salt Lake City, Utah, as well as in Cardston, Alberta, Canada, and Laie, Hawaii. Two earlier temples had functioned briefly in Kirtland, Ohio, and Nauvoo, Illinois. As the body of the church moved west, the saints were forced to leave those two temples behind. The Nauvoo temple was destroyed by an arsonist's fire. It was rebuilt and then dedicated by President Gordon B. Hinckley. The Kirtland Temple was desecrated by enemies of the church. Later, the Kirtland Temple was acquired by Community of Christ, which has owned it for many years. Last month, we announced that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has purchased the Kirtland Temple, along with several significant historical sites in Nauvoo. We greatly appreciate the cordial and mutually beneficial discussions we had with leaders from Community of Christ that led to this agreement. The Kirtland Temple has unusual significance in the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Several events that took place there had been prophesied for millennia and were essential for the Lord's restored church to fulfill its Latter-day mission. The most important of these events occurred on Easter Sunday, April 3, 1836. On that day, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery experienced a series of remarkable visitations. First, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared. The prophet recorded that the Savior's eyes were as the flame of fire the hair of his head was white like the pure snow. His countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was as the sound of the rushing of great waters. During this visitation, the Lord affirmed his identity. He said, quote, I am the first and the last. I am he who liveth. I am he who was slain. I am your advocate with the Father. Close quote. Jesus Christ then declared that he had accepted the temple as his house and made this stunning promise, I will manifest myself to my people in mercy in this house. This significant promise applies to every dedicated temple today. I invite you to ponder what the Lord's promise means for you personally. Following the Savior's visitation, Moses appeared. Moses conferred upon Joseph Smith 
the keys for the gathering of Israel and the return of the ten tribes. When this vision closed, Elias appeared and committed the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham to Joseph. Then Elijah the prophet appeared. His appearance fulfilled Malachi's promise that before the second coming, the Lord would send Elijah to turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Elijah conferred the keys of the sealing power upon Joseph Smith. The significance of these keys being returned to the earth by three heavenly messengers under the direction of the Lord cannot be overstated. Priesthood keys constitute the authority and power of presidency. Priesthood keys govern how the priesthood of God may be used to bring about the Lord's purposes and bless all who accept the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. It is important to note that prior to the organization of the church, heavenly messengers had conferred the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods upon the prophet Joseph and had given him keys of both priesthoods. The keys gave Joseph Smith authority to organize the church in 1830. Then, in the Kirtland Temple in 1836, the conferral of these three additional priesthood keys, namely, keys of the gathering of Israel, keys of the gospel of Abraham, and the keys of the sealing power, was essential. These keys authorized Joseph Smith and all succeeding presidents of the Lord's Church to gather Israel on both sides of the veil, to bless all covenant children with the blessings of Abraham, to place a ratifying seal on priesthood ordinances and covenants, and seal families eternally. The power of these priesthood keys is infinite and breathtaking. Consider how your life would be different if priesthood keys had not been restored to the earth. Without priesthood keys, you could not be endowed with the power of God. Without priesthood keys, the church could serve only as a significant teaching and humanitarian organization, but not much more. Without priesthood keys, none of us would have access to essential ordinances and covenants that bind us to our loved ones eternally and allow us eventually to live with God. Priesthood keys distinguish the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints from any other organization on earth. Many other organizations can and do make your life better here in mortality. But no other organization can and will influence your life after death. Priesthood keys give us the authority to extend all of the blessings promised to Abraham to every covenant-keeping man and woman. Temple work makes these exquisite blessings available to all of God's children, regardless of where or when they lived or 
Now live. Let us rejoice that priesthood keys are once again on the earth. I invite you to consider carefully the following three statements. One, the gathering of Israel is evidence that God loves all of his children everywhere. Two, the gospel of Abraham is further evidence that God loves all of his children everywhere. He invites all to come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female, all are alike unto God. And three, the sealing power is supernal evidence of how much God loves all of his children everywhere and wants each of them to choose to return to him. Priesthood keys restored through the prophet Joseph Smith make it possible for every covenant-keeping man and woman to enjoy incredible personal spiritual privileges. Here again, there is much we can learn from the sacred history of the Kirtland Temple. Joseph Smith's dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple is a tutorial about how the temple spiritually empowers you and me to meet the challenges of life in these last days. I encourage you to study that prayer recorded in Doctrine and Covenants, section 109. That dedicatory prayer, which was received by revelation, teaches that the temple is a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God. This list of attributes is much more than a description of a temple. It is a promise about what will happen to those who serve and worship in the house of the Lord. They can expect to receive answers to prayer, personal revelation, greater faith, strength, comfort, increased knowledge, and increased power. Time in the temple will help you to think celestial and to catch a vision of who you really are, who you can become, and the kind of life you can have forever. Regular temple worship will enhance the way you see yourself and how you fit into God's magnificent plan. I promise you that. We are also promised that in the temple we may receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost. Imagine what that promise means in terms of having the heavens open for each earnest seeker of eternal truth. We are instructed that all who worship in the temple will have the power of God and with angels having charge over them. How much does it increase your confidence to know that as an endowed woman or man armed with the power of God, you do not have to face life alone? What courage does it give you to know that angels really will help you Finally, we are promised that no combination of wickedness will prevail over those who worship 
in the house of the Lord. Understanding the spiritual privileges made possible in the temple is vital to each of us today. My dear brothers and sisters, here is my promise. Nothing will help you more to hold fast to the iron rod than worshiping in the temple as regularly as your circumstances permit. Nothing will protect you more as you encounter the world's mists of darkness. Nothing will bolster your testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ and his atonement or help you understand God's magnificent plan more. Nothing will soothe your spirit more during times of pain. Nothing will open the heavens more. Nothing. The temple is the gateway to the greatest blessings God has in store for each of us. For the temple is the only place on earth where we may receive all of the blessings promised to Abraham. That is why we are doing all within our power under the direction of the Lord to make the temple blessings more accessible to members of the church. Thus, we are pleased to announce that we plan to build a new temple in each of the following 15 locations. Uteroa, French Polynesia. Chihuahua, Mexico. Florianopolis, Brazil. Rosario, Argentina. Edinburgh, Scotland. Brisbane, Australia, South Area. Victoria, British Columbia, Yuma, Arizona, Houston, Texas, South area, Des Moines, Iowa, Cincinnati, Ohio, Honolulu, Hawaii, West Jordan, Utah, Lehigh, Utah, and Maracaibo, Venezuela. My dear brothers and sisters, I testify that this is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He stands at its head. We are his disciples. Let us rejoice in the restoration of priesthood keys which make it possible for you and me to enjoy every spiritual blessing. We are willing and worthy to receive. I so testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our dear Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads together at the close of this sacred gathering, we do so with much love and gratitude in our hearts for Thee and the multitude of Thy tender mercies. We are grateful for our Savior, Jesus Christ, for His premortal Godhood, His perfect life, and His infinite and eternal sacrifice. We are grateful, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ, Prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Oh, how we love and sustain him. We pray for our dear prophet and his beloved wife, Wendy. Heavenly Father, we have heard thy word at this conference, and we pray that we may seek every opportunity to stand in holy places, that we may strive to more regularly attend thy holy house as we seek more diligently to become a holy people. This we pray in the sacred name of the messenger of the covenant himself, Jesus Christ, amen. This has been a broadcast of the Sunday afternoon session of the 194th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from leaders of the church. Music was provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.